Hello and welcome to One on One. I'm Vernon Ramasar, and today I'm honored to have as my guest Martin Daly, Senior Counsel, a, a long standing um, member of the legal fraternity, former president of the Law Association, and former independent senator, and of course, well known as a columnist. Mr. Daly, welcome to the program. Thank you, Vernon. In 11 years, I've never had you on, and I must apologize for that. No, no, no apology necessary. I just assumed you were too big me. for us. No, 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 well, then you don't know me at all. Well, I, I'm hoping to get to know you over Everything the next like, couple I of write interviews. And say, yeah. I, I totally hate being big on entourage and that kind of well, thing. Well, I think a lot of people feel they do know you because of your columns. Because well, you reveal so much of yourself, really. And I you? lime, so they know me from yeah. liming. You're out and about everywhere, especially because Pan is one of your great passions. Yeah, but not Pan alone. I followed local dance, theater, and I just tried my hand at the theater. So like a culture maven, if you will. Well, yes, but I try to avoid those terms. <laughs> no, we, you're here especially, well, we, we'll talk about a number of things about your views and what's going sure. on in society, but you're here because you've got a book coming out on November the 5th. Yes. A collection. Um, it's a, it, what I did was, people have been behind me to do this. So I got a, pro, a professional editor, Judy Raymond, and you got possibly the best professional editor. In well, I think so. Yeah. I, 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 I think Judy's a bit like me. People think she's probably more severe than she really is. I mean, they think that about me. We've, we've got on famously, and she's very particular, good with deadlines. But more importantly, an inhibition on doing this was I didn't have the inclination to read 600 plus columns. And I did not want to be the one choosing them. I, I wanted an objective, a more objective choice. Of course, I had an input, and we traded off a few, took out a few, and put in a few. But basically, it's the editor's choice. I didn't feel able to, so to speak, in inverted commas, judge my own work, or even whether it was worthy of publication. So the bottom line is it's 200 columns out of 600 plus. I started in 2002. And there is one other part of the book that is, was kind of the lead up to my becoming a columnist. When we had the 1818, well, people call it a crisis, when we had the 1818 event, mm -hmm. I was quite upset with the way that the president at the time, which was Robinson, handled it. And I was quite upset that they, they, they took such a shortcut and ended up giving out the government on some, appointing the government on such specious grounds that I wrote a letter to Mr. Manning when he became Prime Minister, copied it to the media, and it caused a huge, um, it got huge attention. And if you like, I, I know it was successful. I would never say something I did was successful myself, but I'll tell you how it was successful. I was at Panorama Preliminaries, well, might not have been 2002, but close to it. And some Pan person, I don't know them, they all know me by name, but you know, these fellas you see walking around. He said, Daily boy, you have to be good. He said, if Lloyd Best like anything, it must be good. And the background to that was that having written this letter to Manning, Lloyd Best wrote not one, but two columns talking about my intervention. And I can't remember what he described it, but he was clearly pleased. And so I, I be, this particular Pan follower thought that I must have something between my ears because Lloyd Bell's like, like something. <laughs> but it, it speaks to something that you're pretty famous for, which is, if you will, poking a stick at those in power. Or well, it's important. Figures. So you, you don't necessarily take people as, as idols that you can't touch. No, because that's completely, well, it's anti-democratic for one thing, and then it leads to a kind of um, political hardening of the arteries where nothing can change. and only expedient standards. I mean, I'm not a big moralist or morality player, but I, I believe strongly that we have to have certain objective standards. And a lot of the societies in inverted commas very covered, maybe understandably because of the size of the government and the economy and so on, which is one of the things I write about all the time. I don't much believe in the state enterprise system with one or two exceptions. And so what happens here is that people are they, 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 they bend their knees to power rather too easily. And, and so I essentially, I kind of, well, I, I, I poke for that reason. Well, have you ever been afraid of victimization? Because so many people in our society are, well, I depending on the administration, they're either for I have or been victimized, not afraid of victimized. I have been victimized um, commercially. But there are, those are isolated exceptions. And on one occasion, I was victimized by a private sector, well, firm for one, I, I don't want to say more about it. 
it's not only not only politicians and people in public life. We, my, my firm was victimized once for something I said in the Senate by somebody who was a clad at the time. Well, yeah, I was against the interest what I said, but I really didn't care. In fact, in the acknowledgments in the book, I do acknowledge how relaxed my partners in the office. I mean, I'm a senior partner of a law firm, and I do acknowledge, I don't use the word relax, I don't remember the word, but I do acknowledge the fact that never we formed our firm right after fusion and opened our doors in January 87. I practiced as a barrister before. And never once did any of my partners ever say to me, you know, you shouldn't write that, it's going to hurt us commercially, we wouldn't get a brief. They have been very, it's just never come up. And I, I think we need to acknowledge that because there have been one or two occasions when we have been victimized for my quote unquote utterances. But what is the urge that you have to make those utterances? Because I, obviously you're a very successful and well-established uh, lawyer. Um, you're clearly doing this not for the money. No, it's anti-money. Yeah, because you're actually affecting, money. You're affecting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not suggesting I've been pauperized or anything of the kind. But you, you do but get... But you may have lost government contracts over the years. Oh, and, and in and private sector, on one spectacular occasion, what motivates me? Well, I just think is what I said. I, I, I think that we can't make progress unless people are constructively critical. And I've just been lucky that I had enough people batting for me who could keep me whole. And also, by the time I got around to being a... a if I mean, I don't like these terms, but from the time I got around to being a high-profile critic, I'd succeeded in the law already. So that even if some people felt squeamish about hiring me. I, I, I'd done well enough. If they wanted to win, your, your views are really irrelevant at that well, point. Well, not everybody sees it that way. But yes, I mean, there, there is a market. Strangely enough, there is a, when people have a really bad case or a bad situation, they actually look around for the most independent-minded person because they realize that just telling them what they want, they, they get to a point where that doesn't work anymore. So. It is only in later, in, in the last two decades or so, that you've really felt the lash where government agencies are concerned. But we make a living. And I mean, I'm very concerned. I don't want to hurt my partners, but we, but we manage. And we have enough backers and, and people who have faith in us and our abilities and our price levels now that lawyers' fees have become such a big deal. We are able to compete on independence and price. But if I say any more, I'll infringe the legal profession act. And, and turn into advertising yes, at that exactly. point. Did, would you say your, your patriotism defines you? <laughs> because out of everything you write, there is a sense that you really want what's best for Trinidad and Tobago. I most certainly do, because I, I, in Trinidad, in which I grew up, I didn't know much about Tobago in those days. I've corrected that. Trinidad, in which I grew up, was really a very pleasant, hospitable place. We didn't have road rage. Well, of course, we didn't have hard drugs, I suppose, which mm -hmm. is a big thing that's changed from that. And so I see, uh, I just would like the good side of Trinidad to be more, to prevail better. Um, I'm not suggesting that we have gone through, as they like to say, but I would like to see the good side of Trinidad prevail better because it is there and I write about it. But you have all of these talented people doing wonderful things, and there's no proper cultural funding policy, no real recognition, and so on. So I, I don't know about patriotism. Um, uh, and I usually when Trinidad people say they're patriotic, they're patriotic when we win a, if we win a gold medal. And then they wave flags in the air. Yeah, and then that's it. I mean, it's, it's not a patriotism that, for example, extends to not throwing a, uh, a, a soft drink bottle out the window. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a more, it's more chauvinism and patriotism so many times. Occasional jingoism. As yeah, to, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. So I, I, I don't rush to sort of, you know, it's interesting when you do something that people approve of, say, boy, you are a real patriot, but you should be a patriot 100% of the time. Even if things are going badly for the country, you must identify. And a lot of Trinities do, but this excessive kind of saccharine love of the country really comes out more at times of success. My thing is that I think we have an extraordinary, for a place this size, we have an extraordinary pool of talented people, particularly in the, but not exclusively in the performing arts. We become, we, we have doctors who have become world famous. We are, we are a very talented country. Now, citizens say that and politicians say that, 
but we've never really had a proper policy to, to make that work for the country. If the doctors get frustrated enough or, or, or good enough, they go away. And they would love to come back, but the conditions are appalling. Um, I mean, I know one doctor who became well-known in Canada and basically left the Port of Spain in general because he had a row with the administration about the fact that you shouldn't have cardiology or sight on a floor above ground because people had to see where they were going and they had to climb stairs or if the elevators didn't work. It's a, that, I mean, that was only symptomatic of a wider frustration. That's a real life story. And so we ought to be able to fix these things. We shouldn't have a traffic problem, but we have no traffic management. So that, you know, I mean, my, I, I write columns about the wreckers sometimes because it's so irrational. They don't clear Park Street, so that clogs up the whole of Border Spain. But if you stop for a few seconds on R.P. Avenue, you shouldn't, but if you do, they swoop on you. Which isn't really an issue when it comes to traffic that It's much. not a big issue yeah. because it's a wide street, but they don't deal with Park Street. So all of those are the things that annoy me. That Some of our problems are not as, as, as fundamental as they seem, but nobody's paying attention. I mean, you, you've got obviously a few years on you. You've been a critical observer for many of those years. Mm -hmm. You've been a columnist for well over a decade. But it seems to me that this country really hasn't really learned lessons as it's moved along. Would no. I be correct in saying that? We still see the same levels of incompetence, the same levels of corruption, the same levels of disaffected citizenry, the same levels of voters just getting frustrated and voting for the least offensive of, of the parties. That's correct. Doesn't, isn't that somewhat depressing that we haven't really found a well, footing to say we're moving up in that direction? Well, the reason I am not terminally depressed is because of the amount of time I spend in the performing arts community, usually as a spectator because I see wonderful young people, very ambitious young people. I mean, I just took part in, in, the, in, a, perform, in a run of Atway, and we had a sixth former there, and, and another, we, had, we had some young people there, and they were all very ambitious, and they didn't come from fancy homes. You know, we'd, when we had rehearsals in Tanabuna, I'd drop them home along the Eastern Main Road, and they were very normal people, and they were all very ambitious. They didn't curse, they didn't, it was obvious that they weren't doing drugs. So I, 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 we have the potential to do so much better. The disconnect is that we have all of these talented people who mean well, but somehow public life, either, they either don't get into public life or if they do, they get corrupted. And I don't just mean money corruption, it's entourage business and um, always being in a VVI. I mean, I think VVIP as a concept is a curse. And so, even if good people go into public life, and I don't only mean politics, they get corrupted by the, the VIP celebrity syndrome. And, and so part of Renard's problem is, one of the reasons we haven't progressed is that the hard drug trade is a big problem. Um, they deny human trafficking, but it, it, it is here. So we are now, apart from our other shortcomings, we have to deal with the hard drug trade, we have to deal with, with a certain amount of human trafficking. And also we have to deal, I'm not one of the, we have to deal with the celebrity culture and the vanity culture which has swept the world. I'm not one of those who says if you switch off American television make us better people. But we certainly have bought into the celebrity culture. And what that means is, to me, the cynical part of me says that to be a celebrity do something moderately well, even if it's take off your clothes moderately well, persuade somebody to go viral with you, and you're made for life. And so the effect that has on a country like ours is it is encouraging shortcut, and it is encouraging vanity and fame. I mean, I don't have a problem with people being vain, but it, it does have an effect to me on not just work ethic, but the need to be ambitious for the country to go forward. It, it speaks of a certain sort of culture of selfishness, doesn't it? I mean, the fact that we don't care what we're doing on the roads, or we don't care what we do to one another, or we don't care about littering, for example, that's a, a culture of selfishness. Where we, what, if it doesn't impact on us, then we don't really care. But as a failure of leadership, um, there, have been, there have been a number, one or two outstanding examples of when the country has pulled together what has happened. For example, after the NER landslide and they had National Cleanup Day, Everybody cleaned up. It didn't matter what constituency you were in. Everybody cleaned up. Everybody bought into it. The famous November the 19th football game mm -hmm. where everybody, you know, I mean, I tied a piece of red cloth. Well, cars still had antennas in those days. I, 
I mean, I, I look back on it now and think I must have been insane to tie this piece of red cloth on my antenna. Those are two examples. We had a, a health scare one carnival. I do, I think it was cholera. It was cholera sure. yeah. And again, as a result of liming, you see, in parentheses, I don't listen to what people say. I go and observe it for myself. For many years, I used to go and look at the children's carnival on a Saturday, usually by Memorial Park. And the year of the cholera scare, it was in very, very noticeable how many parents were now bringing things from home for the children. Sad to say, not patronizing the vendors as much as they might, but they had clearly thought about it. So despite the wildness of carnival and the music and all of this, you saw people actually step back and deal with the situation. So that tells me we're not as selfish and as stupid as people think we are. It's a lack of leadership. Now, it, it shouldn't take a football match or a cholera scare or a, an attempted coup or anything like that. You need, you need constant leadership. And we, we have a serious leadership crisis in the country, and it isn't just about the politicians, it's everywhere. We're sometimes good at creating the illusion of great leadership, though. I mean, we saw what happened after the NER came into power then. We saw in 2010 what happened after as well. We have this expectation of tremendous leadership, and then usually it doesn't manifest itself in well, anything in reality. Well, yeah, you're right. Um, but then the leadership doesn't allow other parts of the body politic to function. I mean, I always, I'm always afraid of being boring. But take a simple example. In all my years in the Senate, I was there maybe for nine years, every budget, they cut Silva's budget. And we'd have to scream and make a lot of noise for it to get put back to where it was. Now, that's an example of what I mean about the formal leadership not understanding leadership at all different levels. Suval is a huge success. Suval is a leader in many communities. I mean, when my mother and aunt who brought me up, both of them basically died of old age. They went sick and they needed to have nurses. We didn't have to get a registered nurse. Suval, Suval had trained many nurses, so you get a Suval nurse. Now that's an example of making, giving people an employment opportunity. Suval is a leader in the community. But the formal leaders don't foster leadership, but if what I'm, I'm sort this through, they, have, they don't foster it at the sub-leadership level. So they, they leave people to catch as catch can and the NGOs are not properly supported. And just giving them money is not enough. You have to teach them accountability. Um, and so, for example, if I would had funds to give out, public funds to give out, I would insist that each body that is in receipt of government funding must immediately give me somebody from their organization to be trained in rudimentary accounts. It would be a term and condition that within one year of getting a subvention, you must have trained somebody to do basic management accounts. Not as hard as it sounds. I mean, in the old days, and probably families like yours and mine, they kept their accounts in a mm -hmm. copy book. They, they budgeted in a copy book or in a piece of old shop, brown paper in a shop. And so, and that way you, 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 you teach people to be leaders of their own little groups and to be accountable and so on. But nobody is taking this on, so. We don't have a culture of it. No, but it's because it, nobody thinks it's important to teach people to do it. And, 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 and part of that is also the fact that we, at, at the leadership level, in terms of, of politics, we seem to have an almost limitless capacity to put up with sometimes overt stupidity of people in office. And we don't expect any, any better. Hmm. The fact that we, we'll say, well, maybe, they, maybe they're stealing money, but they're stealing less than, doesn't say much I, I really do. I understand exactly what you're saying, the culture of acquiescence. Mm -hmm. It's all around us. I suppose it gets back to the fear of victimization. And we're also very small. Everybody's related to everybody else. So it's almost impossible to criticize somebody that you're not linked to either by school, by church, not anything to do with politics at all, or by either blood relative, pumpkin vine relative. There's always some link. And so I really am thought out the culture of acquiescence, but I really think it has to do with how people are linked. And so inevitably you're going to be criticizing somebody that you shouldn't because they're your cousin or your batch or your schoolmate or something. Uh, but I don't have an answer for that. But I mean, you, would, you would still criticize your schoolmate or your cousin or your aunt if they're spending your money badly. 
Well, yeah, but remember, except for that one period of IMF hood, if I can mm. call it that, we've never seen hard times. I've been to Cuba, and I see what is hard times. So we've never had hard times, so we've never had the incentive to save. And, and to be frugal or, or to think about how we spend money. But not, not hard times per se, as you, as you mentioned, but certainly when we look at the traffic situation or you look at our medical system, it, they both could be so much better had we invested wisely and expected more of our leaders to invest our money wisely. But even the leadership of, I think, is the police service. We don't have traffic management. I mean, I, I align a lot. I have to keep apologizing with that. This seems to be an important word in my chapter. Well, it is for me because, you see, I'm not going to say. If you go um, west of, well, we used to call it Williams Bay, where the boardwalk is now. Mm. If, you, if you're trying to come back into town on a Sunday afternoon through Shagaramas and any event is going on, there's gridlock, partly because, well, before the boardwalk, people would form five, six lines, cut across the greens and so on to get on. And, of course, it just makes things worse. I went to see a football, a soccer match, meaning or, or what I know as football in the United States. There were 92,000 people in a stadium just outside of Washington. I went with my stepdaughter and son-in-law, and um, we were in a car park, and the whole traffic arrangement, I don't want to bore your listeners with it, but the whole traffic arrangement, we got out of that car park quicker than you could get from Tetra Bay to... Kokorit on a Sunday afternoon. With 92,000 people. With 92,000 people. It's a simple thing. The police determined that there were four lines to come out, and if you broke that line, well, you spend the night there. But it was, it was managed by police, not, not anything fancy. And then they did certain things, thoughtful things with the road. Um, they, 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 they reversed the traffic flow on some of the roads, so at the time you were arriving, a road that would normally not be going in the direction, they reversed the traffic flow. And these are simple basic things, but we don't seem able to do them. Because we're always trying to reinvent the wheel, it seems. They're perfectly good examples of how things run properly in other parts of the world. And rather than saying, okay, let's just adapt that to our purposes, we want to try and do something completely new half the time. I don't know if I buy that. I, no? It's a combination of things. We, we, we don't really suffer here. I, I, I'm not suggesting people don't suffer. But I mean, on a broad basis, if you reach late for work, people have accepted. I mean, my staff come into the office at up past six in the morning. We can't really do flexi time because our people we do business with are not open at that hour. When I say, we, let me retract that, that's a bit broad. But, but we don't have any, I mean, apart from people getting ill and getting into road crashes, so let me, let me retract that. But generally, life in Trinidad is still pretty sweet. We do have snow. We have, we have floods and they're terrible, so don't let my viewers think I'm hard hearted. But generally, the challenges, overall challenges, outside of particular events and particular things in life, we just chug along and it's warm and you, you see a partner on the road if in a traffic jam. And, you know, life here is still can be easy. It's very hard for a lot of people, and I know a lot of people in depressed areas who, who do suffer. But overall, it doesn't seem to affect the country as a whole. So they have a flood in Central, it's awful, we see the pictures, we sympathize, but it doesn't affect the whole country, so they, they will fight up with their floods in the rainy season. And we'll go liming while we're not flooding. Yeah, yeah, well, we had, we had coup parties and yeah. state of emergency parties, and when, I think it was Brett was threatened, you, you couldn't get into a bar in St. James, although we, there was a possible threat of hurricane. I don't understand that part of our psyche, but it doesn't bother me, because it's what stops us from killing each other. Um, and it, what's, what, what, what soothes any racial tensions we have. So there is a, there is a positive and helpful side to the, the laissez-faire nature. So the, the part of us says, this is all ridiculous and exasperating and I want to scream. And the other half says, well, things aren't that bad and I can go lime with my friends later and, you know, it could be much worse. Yeah. And if somehow we psychologically balance the two and say, well, just don't rock the boat. Kind of, yeah. And then we always, everybody has a partner in something, so whether it is on a line at the airport or a line for a passport, a lot of people a contact are able, in WASA, a contact exactly, in TNTAC, people are, So the, the suffering that I'm talking about, and I have to keep qualifying it, there are people who lead very hard, horrible lives. Um, but suffering is relative as with so many other things. Like yeah, what but, you view but, as suffering. And yeah. you see, the people who might be the leaders or might at least shape public opinion who are not at the 
living on the margin and, and worse, the people who might shape public opinion and might protest against conditions not being what they should be, somehow or other they either get by because it's overall it's nice or there's a partner to help them out. So if I don't have to stand in line for passport, I don't care how many other people do. Or if I don't have to stand in line, you know, to get a blood transfusion or whatever it is, or, or somebody will whisk me through the customs in the airport. It's powerfully cool. That's actually something that it, it's a bad thing technically, but when you go to other countries and you don't have that option, it suddenly becomes something that you sort of miss to a certain extent. That well, you have except no, because everybody stands in line. The average time, whatever it is, to stamp your passport, whatever is three minutes, four minutes, and you don't have the aggravation of seeing people come out of line while you are still there. So I, I think this whole question of service in the sense of service industries and services being subject to the contact system is really pretty frustrating. Well, Martin Daly, we're out of time for this part of the interview, um, but you, we'll talk more in our part two about the daily, well, you've got a better, more color version over there. We'll show that in the next interview, the daily commentaries, and more about your views in Finland and Tobago as we continue our conversation. But I thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. You've been watching One on One. Join us again tomorrow for part two.